Hello, Montana. Hello, Republic of Korea. And hello, world. This is Connect Montana. I'm Chris Hislop, the Executive Director of the Montana World Affairs Association. Thank you all for joining us tonight on a most extraordinary event. Unlike our usual Connect Montanas, which run a paltry 30 minutes, we're going to go a little bit longer and a little bit deeper into a number of issues that affect Montana and Montanans and the United States very deeply. Tonight, we're talking about US and Republic of Korea relations in the 21st century. And we're going to look more deeply into several elements of that. I'd like to start by thanking our very generous sponsors tonight for this event the Korea Economic Institute and the World Affairs Councils of America. Now the 5,600 miles between Montana and the Republic of Korea may seem like a very long way. But in fact, when we begin to look at all of the connections that Montana and the United States has with the Re Republic of Korea, it doesn't quite seem so far away. Here in Montana, our economy is heavily based on agriculture, farmers and ranchers across Montana. They all know that the Republic of Korea is our second largest trade partner, taking nearly $300 million of Montana exports per year. That would affect all of us, not just the farmers and ranchers around this state, but everybody who is associated with the agricultural economy. In addition, if you have a Samsung phone in your pocket, you have a connection with Korea. Of course, Samsung being a major Korean firm. Did you drive your Hyundai to work today? There you go. Did you watch Parasite win the Academy Awards? Did you have a chance to watch Korean baseball during the pandemic? Are you watching Korean golfers play professionally around the world? All of these things touch our lives very closely. And I'm very happy that we were able to bring three experts onto our show tonight. I'm going to introduce our guests one by one, and then they will have a chance for 10 to 15 minutes to speak briefly on a number of issues. And then what we'll do is, we'll, like usual, we're going to open the program up to Q&A from our participants. Now, those of you who are used to these Zooms, which is nearly everybody, will know that you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to type in a question. You can type it to me or to everyone, and I will curate those questions as they come in during the Q&A session. So if that's clear, let me go ahead and introduce our guests for tonight. Hyung Kwon Jung is a Korean diplomat currently serving at the Republic of Korea Embassy in Washington, D.C. Upon joining the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2011, Mr. Jung served in various posts, including the Republic of Korea U.S. Security Cooperation Division. He served as a Korean exchange diplomat in the U.S. Department of State. He also did the mandatory military service in the Republic of Korea U.S. Combined Forces Command. He holds a BA degree in international relations from Seoul National University and a master's degree in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. Next, we have Mr. Mark Tokola. He's the vice president of the Korea Economic Institute of America in Washington, D.C. He retired as a U.S. Senior Foreign Service Officer with the rank of Minister Counselor in September 2014. His last posting was as Minister Counselor for Political Affairs at U.S. Embassy London. Previously, he had served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the American Embassies in Seoul, Republic of Korea, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and Reykjavik, Iceland. Among his other postings were two tours at the U.S. Mission to the European Union in Brussels, Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs at Embassy London, and Economic Counselor at U.S. Embassy The Hague. He also served as director of the Iraq Transition Assistance Office in Baghdad from 2007 to 2008. Mr. Tokola received the State Department's Superior Honor Award for his work on implementing the Dayton Peace Accords while serving as political counselor in Sarajevo, Bosnia-Herzegovina from, from 1997 to 1999. He holds a BA in International Relations from Panoma College in Claremont, California, and an LLM in European Community Law from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. 
Mr. Tokola serves on the Board of Governors of DECOR, an organization of foreign affairs professionals, and on the Board of Trustees of the Bacon House Foundation. Finally, Angela Kerwin is a career member of the U.S. Senior Foreign Service. She assumed her current position as the Director of the Office of Korean Affairs at the U.S. Department of State in July 2019. Immediately prior, Ms. Kerwin served as the Council General and Minister Counselor for Consular Affairs at U.S. Embassy Seoul. Ms. Kerwin's previous overseas postings included two tours of Mexico, one as Principal Officer of the U.S. Consulate General Matamoros, and her first tour in Mexico City. She also served as Visa Chief at U.S. Embassy Bogota, Colombia, and in Consular and Political Roles in India and the Dominican Republic. Within the State Department, Angela served as an analyst in the Executive Office of the Bureau of Consular Affairs. Ms. Kerwin earned a Juris Doctor from the Dickinson School of Law and a Master's Degree in Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College. Her undergraduate degree in Life Sciences is from Penn State. Angela received numerous awards during her State Department career, including the Barbara M. Watson Award for Consular Excellence and multiple Superior Honor Awards. Prior to joining the State Department, Angela practiced law in Pennsylvania. She's a return Peace Corps volunteer who served two years in the Kingdom of Tonga. Ms. Kerwin has a 14-year-old son, Lucas, who helps her hone her negotiating skills on a daily basis. I would like to thank you all for joining us on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. I don't think we could have a, a better panel um, full of people with remarkable expertise, uh, length and breadth of, of expertise on Korea. So um, if I could, I'd first like to go to Mark Tokola from the Korea Economic Institute to give your perspective on US-Korea relations in the 21st century. Over to you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And thank you for inviting us to be with you. Uh, I sincerely wish I was there in person. I would love to be in Montana right now. I work in Washington, D.C. My home is in Washington State, and so I feel like we're fellow members of that great northern tier of American states. Let me briefly introduce KEI. Um, KEI is a part think tank and part public outreach organization based in Washington, D.C. It was founded in 1982 for the purpose of improving mutual understanding between the United States and Korea. We do that through conducting and sponsoring research. We offer public events such as this one to speak with schools and organizations such as the uh, World, Montana World Affairs Council in collaboration with the World Affairs Councils of America. Let me start by answering two questions, uh, why Korea and why Montana? <clears throat> so first, South Korea is an important ally of the United States because it is large, productive, and democratic. So how important is South Korea in the global scheme? Uh, let's look at it this way. Now, how many countries in the world are both big and rich? Okay, by big, I mean population of 50 million or more. And by rich, I mean a per capita GDP of $20,000 a year or more. So there are big countries that are not that wealthy. Uh, by that, I would include China and Russia and India, for example. They're big, they're not rich. Then there are countries that are uh, relatively wealthy, but they're small in population. So you might think of the Netherlands or Sweden or Singapore as being in that category. So how many countries are both large and wealthy? And if that's the criteria, you come down to the number of seven. So four are in Europe, the UK, Germany, France, and Italy. That shows that Europe still matters in the world. Outside of Europe, only three countries in the world are that big and wealthy, the United States, Japan, and South Korea. So South Korea is a part of a very elite group of countries. Uh, most people think of South Korea as a great economic success, and that's true. It's also worth remembering that it's also a great example of democracy. Since the 1980s, South Korea has been solidly democratic with competing political parties, a free press, a fair legal system, and a strong record of protecting human rights. So that's South Korea, why Montana? Well, every U.S. state has a connection to South Korea, but Montana has a particular connection. Uh, as Chris mentioned, South Korea is Montana's second largest export destination, second only to Canada. And under the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement that came into effect in 2012, Montana has done really well in its trade with South Korea. You're running a surplus with South Korea of almost $300 million per year. Uh, let me say a few words about North Korea, because I know that's a topic that interests people. 
My organization, KEI, did a recent public opinion survey that showed the Americans believe that North Korea is the third biggest threat to the United States behind um, China and Russia, but not that far behind them. 84% of the American public think it's important North Korea denuclearize. 83% of the American public think the US should press North Korea on its human, human rights record. And the result that surprised me most in this poll, which we just took in August, was that only a third of Americans, 31%, approve of the way the Trump administration has dealt with North Korea. Now, all this attention focused on North Korea is remarkable, given North Korea is actually a small, poor country. With a population of 25 million or so, it's half the population of South Korea. And economically, the difference is massive. Uh, South Korea has a GDP of around $1.6 trillion a year. That makes the world's 10th biggest economy. Now, North Korea does not publish statistics, but the US government's best guess of the size of the North Korean economy, and I'm including black market activities, illicit activities, everything, is around $60 billion a year. And that may be, may be a high estimate. That is the same size as the economy of Des Moines, Iowa. So think of how much effort it would take for Des Moines, Iowa to develop its own nuclear weapons arsenal and its own ICBM force from its city budget. I'm not encouraging them to do that. I'm just saying it's amazing North, Carolina, North uh, Korea has managed to do that with as little resources it has, quite a feat. So going into 2021, I suspect North Korea is gonna reemerge as an issue, whether for a second Trump term or a first Biden term. Uh, although North Korea has not tested a nuclear device or long range missile for some time, they're continuing to develop them and they'll want to test them sooner or later. On October 10th, they rolled out a new ICBM that we've not seen before. Uh, the North Korean economy is also in deep trouble. So it makes North Korea a fragile, frightened state at this point, I believe, partly from the sanctions and partly from the pandemic, but mostly because of their own economic mismanagement. Uh, North Korea very much wants the US and the United Nations to lift economic sanctions. Although even if every sanction was lifted today, it wouldn't be enough to save the North Korean economy. It is fundamentally broken. Kim Jong-un is under pressure. So if Joe Biden's elected, I doubt if North Korea will be high on his list of to-dos, given all the domestic challenges we'll be facing. But I suspect North Korea will refuse to be ignored. It's like to do something to demand our attention, uh, whether the Biden administration, if that's what happens, wants to get engaged early or not. There's a lot more I could say. Um, let me stop there and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues and trying to answer your questions. Mark, thank you very much for that introduction. I think it really situates well some of the key issues now, uh, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, certainly, and kind of looking at the partnership uh, between the United States and the Republic of Korea. And we're going to hear more now from our other guests. I'd like to invite uh, Hyun Kwang Jung, who is at the Korean Embassy in uh, Washington, D.C., um, to come on and give your perspective uh, on the issues. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chris. Um, ladies and gentlemen, hello. My name is HK Jung, working at the Korean Embassy in Washington, DC. I'm actually, I'm really honored to be a panelist at today's event. Thank you, uh, KEI and Montana World Affairs Council for giving me this precious opportunity. This is actually my first time to participate in this type of event and discuss foreign policy uh, with US public as a diplomat. I will try to make today's event not as one-sided boring lecture, um, but an interactive and conversational event. And my boss, who is Ms. Angeles Curran's counterpart and wasn't able to attend the event due to other meetings, told me that whenever I get a hardball question, I should ask for her help. So Angela, I'll pretend if you're sitting right next to me and then I'll, I'll look at you if there's, there's any questions that I can't answer. <laughs> so uh, before talking about the Korea-US alliance, I have to tell you this first. I, I have spent one sixth of my entire life in the US. One year in Chicago as a seventh grader, one year in Tallahassee, Florida as a exchange student, two years in Boston as a graduate student and two years in DC now. Um, so if there's someone who are good at math, you will be able to calculate my age. <laughs> and furthermore, uh, my wife got her PhD degree in University of Minnesota and now, te now teaching in um, Auburn University in Alabama. 
So my wife and I, uh, uh, my family have spent quite some time in the U.S. and I've been fortunate enough to become a Korean diplomat and work in the U.S. Korea is now one of the advanced nations around the world uh, that went through rapid economic development. And the main reason for this transformation is the Korea-U.S. alliance. It's just, it's just a foundation. This year is actually 70th anniversary of the Korean War, start of the Korean War. Young men from all over the U.S. responded to the nation's call to go to Korea, as is written on the wall of the Korean War Veterans Memorial here in Washington, D.C., defend, quote, a country few knew and a people they had never met, unquote. We are really grateful their, for their service, and we will never forget their sacrifice. The sacrifice of these veterans is the foundation for our alliance, which has underwritten the peace, security, and prosperity of Korea and the wider re region for the past decades. Even now, there are uh, 28,500 American men and women in uniform serving in Korea. I also did my two years of military service as a member of Combined Forces Command, the warfighting headquarters of Korea and the US. These are the basic security aspects of Alliance, but of course our relationship is much more than that. So let me talk about how we are working on the economic side as well. Korea and the US are important economic partners for each other. The Corus FTA is the pillar of our economic cooperation. Free trade has benefited both countries so much that the US is now Korea's second largest trading partner and Korea is the US's sixth largest and Montana's second largest. Korea has many globally famous, famous companies loved by US consumers as, uh, as Chris mentioned in the introduction. I'm sure all of you know their names and many of you are actually using their product, products. Our relationship is also strong on the investment side, which is significant from a longer term perspective. The US is Korea's number one inbound investor. For Korean companies, the US is the largest investment destination. They are making cutting edge investments in IT and research and development, automobiles and energy. And Koreans have a profound tradition of innovation and we have been using that spirit of innovation in dealing with all sorts of challenges, including the recent COVID-19 pandemic. The tracing and testing method we pioneered has helped us check the spread of the pandemic. And drive-through testing, which first began in Korea, has been adopted in many other countries, including the US. In fact, since the early days of the pandemic, we have partnered with the US to defeat the virus. The current adversity uh, has given Korea and the US the chance to work in new areas and in new ways. Our collaboration has been exemplary. When the virus first hit Korea early this year, we immediately coordinated closely and kept our borders open. When the virus hit the US, Korea helped supply the US with testing kits and medical research to help the US flatten its curve. We donated 2.5 million masks, including half a million for Korean war veterans. We have worked with state governments to fight the pandemic in addition to the federal government. We are still assisting uh, each other, including by sharing our experience on how to run an election during the pandemic as my country successfully did in April. Unfortunately, no single country is completely free from COVID-19 and its end is not yet in sight. Still, the pandemic has demonstrated that the Korea-US alliance can rise up to face unforeseen challenges that we can count on each other as friends and partners and then we can deliver tangible benefits to both of both our peoples. This brings me to my final point, the deepening friendship between our people. This is important because both Korea and the US are democracies. Like the US, the Korean constitution begins with the phrase, we the people. And fortunately, the people of our countries share a friendship, not just our governments. For example, on a per capita basis, there are far more Korean students in US higher education institutions than from any other country in the world. In terms of total numbers, Korea comes third after China and India, countries with much larger populations. 
By studying in the U.S., Korean students get an even better appreci appreciation of the U.S. and Americans than earlier generations were ab ever able to. What is great about these people-to-people -people exchanges is that they can work both ways, enriching everyone in the process. This is also true for cultural exchanges. For many years, American movies and music have been popular in Korea. These days, Americans are also digging deeper into K-culture. You probably know director Bong Joon-ho's Academy Award-winning Parasite and BTS. Maybe there are folks whose kids are army fans today or army friends themselves. My American friends also uh, often told me that uh, best shows on Netflix are Korean shows. As a junior diplomat from Korea, I'm trying my best to contribute to Korea-US alliance. Uh, the alliance will remain the link, mean as a linchpin of peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, and the anchor of Korea's foreign and security policy. Over the past seven decades, the relationship has grown from a military alliance to a comprehensive alliance of shared values and interest and thriving ties between our people. So thank you so much. And I am looking forward to uh, discussing all the questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, HK, for that. I, I thought it was very interesting, your last point there about, you know, the movement from a military alliance to something much broader. And I know that um, our guests will be interested to hear more about that. And really, what does it mean to them? What does it mean to Montanans and to Americans to have this kind of uh, relationship, a partnership, an alliance, if you will, uh, with the Republic of Korea? And I will just also say, HK, in, in your one sixth of your life here in the United States, um, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to come to Montana yet. Um, sadly, uh, the, the, um, we were not able to hold this in person as initially expected, but I want you and the other panelists to know um, that the Republic of Korea is a focus country for the Montana World Affairs Council this year. We'll be talking a lot about Korea. So we're gonna leave the invitation open to you and other panelists in hopes that one day you can meet us here and, and travel around the state with us. So thanks for that. Now we're going to go over to Angela Kurwin. Angela, over to you, please. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Um, and thanks also uh, to Mark and to uh, KEI for sponsoring this evening. Um, it's hard to follow HK. He, he, he had all the points down, so he did a great job. And um, I will pale in comparison. Uh, so I will, uh, I will be brief so that we have a lot of time for questions. Um, essentially, Mark took all the North Korea points, HK took all the South Korea points. I, maybe I should talk about Japan, I'm not certain, but uh, I think we'll take a pass on that. Um, I, I do think uh, I want to touch uh, for a quick minute on, on the alliance uh, between the United States and Korea. And I do uh, believe that sometimes um, there's a, a, a misunderstanding of exactly what alliance is, or maybe maybe just a lack of foreign policy uh, background. Um, I can tell you that uh, this morning we had a chance to talk to some students from Montana. And even uh, talking to them, I, I, I said, look, we got, we got partners, we've got, uh, we've got allies, and they're a little bit different. In my mind, a partner is somebody that you're dating and an ally is somebody that you've married. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward. It means you're in it for the long haul. It means that you're in it uh, for better and for worse. And with Korea, we are incredibly fortunate because from the end of the Korean War onward, or at least to the armistice onward, it's not actually technically ended if you want to get very legalistic about it. Um, we have mostly had better times with, with the Republic of Korea. Uh, we are excellent partners. We are partners um, in security matters. Uh, dealing with the threats. Um, interesting that Mark talked about North Korea being the number third threat, but also China and Russia, both in the neighborhood. Um, so all three threats uh, that the U.S. considers the greatest threats uh, right now are right in that particular area. It's really fantastic to have a friend and ally in that area when you're dealing with those types of threats. Um, we have a relationship, a strong economic relationship, Everybody else has talked about that, so I won't, uh, I won't push that right now. We have um, cultural exchanges. We have student exchanges. We've got uh, 
joint projects that deal with every, everything from space to environmental projects to health projects. Um, we work on a daily basis with, with the Koreans. And as much as I would love to say that everybody in the United States understands how deep our partnership is with Korea, uh, we are often overshadowed by the news about North Korea. Um, so I do think it's important, and I try to do this anytime I'm talking to any group, to tell folks that the United States and the Republic of Korea, South Korea, we work together um, hand in hand to make sure that we are on the same page when dealing with North Korea. It's important that uh, we share uh, our information, we share strategy, we share uh, all of the diplomatic information, all of the economic information, all of the information that we have in order to figure out what's the best way to work um, with North Korea or deal with North Korea as a threat if North Korea is not willing to work with us. So um, I think that sometimes is overlooked. We, we hear about the ICBMs, we hear about uh, Kim Jong-un shooting something off, fireworks uh, as I call them. Um, but behind the scenes, uh, HK and I, as well as the whole South Korean embassy, the whole Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, the whole government uh, within South Korea is working with the interagency in Washington so that we can ensure that we continue to uh, stay together um, as we confront uh, one of the one of the largest threats um, on the planet right now. Um, I will uh, also talk about very quickly, and then we'll get to questions, one area that I don't think anybody has touched on yet, and that's um, Korea's role within the region. Korea uh, has, as Mark said, moved into the into the Super 7, um, uh, big and rich. Uh, and as big and rich, not only has Korea taken care of its own people, it's begun to exert considerably more influence in, um, in Asia and actually around the world. Uh, the Republic of Korea currently has something called the New Southern Policy that works with uh, many of the Southeast Asian countries. It marries up nicely with the US policy called the Indo-Pacific Strategy. So another area that we work very closely with Korea in it is to sync our two um, strategies together, Indo-Pacific Strategy and New Southern Policy, so that we can ensure that we are complementing each other when we're providing training or assistance or whatever it happens to be to um, one of the other countries in the, in the area. Uh, in fact, just this past August, we had our first um, Indo-Pacific uh, Indo -Pacific strategy, new Southern policy dialogue um, to make sure that we are uh, not repeating each other's work and instead um, building upon each other's work so that um, we can continue to, to help uh, folks in that area. Um, our political and military ties are incredibly tight. HK mentioned we've got 28,000 plus US troops on the Korean Peninsula. That may be one of your connections to Korea. You may know somebody who has served there, um, who has rotated through. And uh, inevitably, I, I expect they've come back and told you what a great time they've had in Korea. Um, it's, a, it's a joint uh, uh, military in that we work side by side with the Koreans. Combined Forces Korea, which HK also mentioned, means that the US military and the, in the, in the Korean military are working interoperably. They, they share the same goal. Uh, I think uh, we are we are getting close to a uh, half hour. So let me stop there. Let's go on to questions so that we can hear what you'd like to hear about and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. So thanks very much. That's great, Angela. Thank you so much for um, those comments uh, and to all of our panelists. Let me remind uh, everybody who's watching tonight that you are welcome to chat in your questions to me, and then I will relate them um, to the panelists. Some are coming in already, some to everyone, some just to me. And I will um, also just pick up on, on a point Angela made. We had a event with Montana students this morning who provided a series of extraordinarily insightful questions to this panel. Uh, I think they did Montana very proud and I would uh, like to see some of the same things. I, uh, because the questions were so, uh, so on point, I didn't have a chance to ask any of my questions, of which I have many, and I might even steal some of the students' questions tonight, who knows? But um, maybe I could kick things off a little bit following up on Angela's last comment on the 
Asia Pacific regional aspect of Korea. Now, the Asia Pacific is, a, a, of course, a, a key and critical region um, to you, the United States, um, not simply in terms of, of trade, but um, really across the board, um, uh, uh, an important part uh, uh, of American foreign policy and has been for decades. I wonder, HK, if I could start with you, just to give the the perspective on the region from the from the Korean perspective, not necessarily from from the American foreign policy perspective. What are um, some Korean priorities for the region in, in terms of foreign policy? And then another question to you and and to the other panelists is, you know, why should Americans care about? the Asia Pacific region in, in itself. Um, uh, what importance does that have, you know, more broadly in the world and to America? So HK, if I could start with you, please. Thank you, Chris. Um, about the priority of our government uh, in the region, Asia Pacific region, um, definitely as um, all of you know, it'd be uh, the threat from North Korea. So as Angela mentioned, we are technically at a status of war right now. So um, we are doing our best to deter any North Korean provocations. And things has been worked quite well with our uh, so-called uh, Korea peace process with the help from the US. And there has been a series of summit meetings between three countries, the North Korea, South Korea, and the US. Uh, but things are a bit stalled and uh, right now but we still believe that there's a still chance uh, uh, for North Korea and including our countries to, to, to come to the table and then uh, discuss the peace and the stability of the region. And um, I want to stress that North Korea is not just the problem, not problem of not just Korea or the US, it's a problem of the entire country. So for example, uh, it's, it's proliferation, uh, it's, it's building a lot, of, a lot of missiles, which is, destabilizing the region, which might affect Russia and China and in other countries, Japan, uh, not only uh, South Korea and the US. And also its missiles can reach um, uh, the US uh, continent. So it's not just a threat uh, for our country, the Korea. So uh, the international society, the whole international uh, society is working uh, alongside with Korea and the US to put more pressure on Korea so that uh, uh, their leader can come up to the table and then discuss peace. So I'll stop here. Thanks a lot for that, HK. Uh, Mark, could I go over to you just to see if you have any perspective on looking at Korea's role in the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, I'm inclined to let Angela go first because she can oh. speak to policy. Um, okay, very let's good. Do that, and then I'll, then I'll do that, I'll clean up. <laughs> Sounds good. Angela, over to you. That's good, Mark. I kind of like the baseball references since the World Series is starting tonight. Good job. <laughs> also, uh, one of those things that uh, the U.S. and Korea share, I love of a good baseball game. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, the role of uh, the ROC in the Asia Pacific um, uh, and how that plays in with U.S. policy, I think uh, I talked a little bit about the Indo-Pacific strategy and the new Southern policy, but what's really important, I think, that um, that the... South Koreans bring is uh, an example. Here is a country that went from a wartime footing to one of the top 10 economies in the world in 70 years. They did it because they're a democracy. Like HK said, similar to the US, we the people starts their constitution. And it starts their constitution because they value democracy, they value rule of law, they value openness, they value transparency, they value the same values that the, the United States values. And therefore um, that is one of the reasons that uh, it is important for the, the Koreans to share those values with other countries with, within Asia Pacific. Um, there's a really big country in Asia that maybe doesn't share those values. Starts with a C, ends with an A. I'm pretty sure you know what it is. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that um, is important throughout the region are the example is that the Koreans are able to show countries, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, um, and even smaller countries, if you get down into the Pacific Island nations and you get into Tuvalu and Tonga and Fiji, uh, Palau, 
um, all important countries. And in some ways in sitting in where they sit geographically, there is a natural tendency of course, to look to China, it's right there. We should, uh, and China is probably their largest trading partner. In fact, I think of all of those I just named, I think China might be the largest. Maybe some of the Pacific Islands have a larger trade with Australia, I'm not 100% certain there. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the Korean success speaks for itself. Um, uh, the Korean success in such a short time period, and those of you who may have studied a little bit of Korea ha have probably heard the term miracle on the Han, and the Han River goes right through Seoul, and it's the economic development and of the country um, in such a short period of time that has made it not only a regional power, but a, a global power as well. Uh, so I think, I think that's important. I do think that um, it's impossible to talk about Asia Pacific without talking about uh, the People's Republic of China. And that of course is uh, something that he, we have recently in the United States um, been more vocal about sharing the differences uh, in the way the Chinese treat their people and the values that the Chinese Communist Party espouses, as opposed to those values that are a part of the system of democracies around the world. And uh, in, in making sure that, uh, that even though China is an economic powerhouse, um, we need to recognize that it's, um, the way it runs a society, it's, it's closed nature, uh, it's authoritarian nature um, is not uh, uh, something that um, leads itself to the opportunity for the Chinese people themselves to grow and expand and have the ability to do something similar to what the Koreans have done. And I'll let Mark. Uh, I'll let Mark take it from there. There's all sorts of ways to go. HK, HK went North Korea. I want China and South. Mark, maybe you should take India. There you go. The far oh, edge. Uh, of the, I'll, 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 I'll Mark, actually mention Mark, you're, you're okay. welcome to take India or or any other aspect there that you'd like to pick up. But I, I would also ask you just to, you know, to to uh, you know, look at the question again. Why does this matter to people who are watching this show? Why is um, a strong Korea? Um, an influential regional Asia Pacific actor important for uh, America and America's interests as well. So if, if you wouldn't mind touching on that. Yeah, happy to. Let me do something else first, very briefly. I'd like to pick up on Angela's kind of interesting point about the difference between alliances and partnerships. But I've been thinking about that since you said it. And let me give you one anecdote that shows what an alliance looks like. How do allies treat each other? So the government of South Korea has sent face masks in the mail from South Korea to every American veteran of the Korean War. That's how allies treat each other. Didn't make a big deal out of it, just did it because it was a correct thing to do. I, I think it's terrific. It's remarkable, but not unusual for South Korea. They remember their friends. Okay, on the region, um, I've worked in both Europe, as you mentioned, and I've worked in, uh, in Northeast Asia, and I've always been struck by how different they are. So when we're, when we're working on North European security, transatlantic, it's highly networked. It's the US working through NATO and working with the European Union. And so it's very collective. Uh, Asia is completely different. Now, up to this point, it's been a whole bunch of bilateral relationships. So we have a defense treaty with South Korea, one with Japan, work with Australia, burgeoning development of a relationship with India. But it's always one on one. So it's like a hub and spoke system. And I'm predicting that's going to change. Um, I think the countries of Asia that uh, share values are going to see benefits in working together and thus working with that collective group. I don't know what it'll look like, but watch for it. I think at some point you're going to see an emerging community of democracies in Northeast Asia and the United States, we're a Pacific power too, that will find ways to cooperate, deal with challenges rather than doing it all hub and spoke. Um, Northeast Asia matters because it's the, it is the driver of the world economy. The countries in Northeast Asia, including China, are powering the world economy right now. And so if things go wrong with that, we would be in a depression. The economy matters very much. And just the fact they've been at peace for so long doesn't mean they always will be. Northeast Asia is dangerous. There are still some serious security issues 
not only raised by, by Korea, but tensions between, between China and um, Taiwan and Japan. Russia plays a meddling role. Things go wrong very rapidly in Northeast Asia. And if they did, we've got deep interest and alliances there we'd have to move to defend. So we need to pay a special attention to Northeast Asia, both for economics and for security. It's part of the world we cannot ignore. Okay, uh, we have a question from one of our, uh, our viewers. Um, it's a two-part question. I think the first part may go to you, Angela, and the second one maybe to HK. Uh, uh, part one, after uh, Donald Trump took office in 2016, uh, he appointed an ambassador to Korea. Who, uh, and who is the ambassador and what is the ambassador's background? That's part A, the US ambassador. Angela, maybe over to you on that one. And then the second part of the question is, what is the status of nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. Angela, over to you. Okay, um, the US ambassador to Korea is Harry Harris. And uh, he's uh, one of my favorite people. I had the great pleasure to work for him directly for a year when I was a consul general in Seoul. And it was the year that he arrived uh, in Korea. Um, so as uh, it, his background, um, I don't think could be any better suited uh, to what he's doing right now. He, um, he is a political appointee. Some of our uh, ambassadors, of course, are career uh, diplomats. Some of them are political appointees. Um, but I call him a political appointee light and not because he's a lightweight, uh, but because his background is 40 years of military service in the U.S. Navy. So he is a U.S. government employee from the minute he entered the U.S. Naval Academy um, until the current day. In fact, he uh, retired uh, from the Navy, and um, he didn't retire as an ensign. He retired as a four-star admiral, uh, and he retired as the, the, the head of uh, Pacific Command, which is situated in, in Honolulu and covers all of the Asia-Pacific area. So he uh, retired on uh, May 31st and within two weeks, he was on the State Department roles and going through the confirmation process to become the ambassador, the US ambassador to Korea. If you are a Twitter follower, he's kind of a fun guy to follow on Twitter, um, Harry Harris, uh, I, I recommend it. You could not ask for a better representative of the United States in Korea. Um, he works well with the Korean government he enjoys uh, what he can in Korea. Right now, everything's a little bit constrained because of COVID, um, but he has gotten out to uh, all, all the parts of Korea. Um, he is very plugged in uh, with uh, policy, and he works very closely with uh, our Secretary of State uh, and with our, our President um, on Korean policy and on North Korea policy. Um, part two, what was part two of the question? Ambassador, and then there was a harder part, part two. Part, oh yeah, nuclear weapons. So you, you can pass <laughs> that to HK or if you'd like to say there something you go. there, go right ahead. Uh, I, well, I'll, 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 I'll start, but then I'll pass it to HK. Um, HK mentioned uh, in his opening comments that there are nuclear weapons in North Korea. There are nuclear weapons in North Korea. It is our policy to denuclearize North Korea. And in my last segment, I talked about uh, the fact that the U.S. and China don't see eye to eye on everything. We do see eye to eye on this. It's one of the areas of, uh, that we both share. Both of um, these world powers believe that uh, the possession of nuclear weapons by North Korea is a destabilizing activity in the, in the region and in the world. Uh, HK also mentioned that... Um, this is not a US problem. This is not a Republic of Korea problem. This is a world problem. Uh, the world has decided that there should not be nuclear weapons in North Korea. Um, how is that effectuated? It's effectuated through UN Security Council re uh, resolutions, um, which have placed sanctions on North Korea and limited their ability to trade commodities, limited their ability to interact uh, with the rest of the world. And it is um, very much due to the fact that uh, they have nuclear weapons. HK, you wanna add a, a bit more about that? Um, actually, I think you've answered uh, the question, but I would add a little bit of a background, like the history of uh, the nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. So, um, 
As I said, when Korean War broke out in uh, 70 years ago in, in 19, 1950 and it ended at 1953, uh, at that time, our conventional force level was much uh, lower than that of uh, North Korea. And then in order to help level the, the asymmetric uh, nature of the conventional forces, uh, the US forces in Korea uh, had a couple of uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, inside the Korean Peninsula to help uh, deter North Korea. Uh, but uh, with the START agreement with Russia, the Bush administration at that, then, uh, that time uh, decided to pull out all the nuclear tactical nuclear weapons uh, from the peninsula and we also agreed. And actually in 1991 December, um, the two Koreas decided to declare a denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula where we agreed to uh, get rid of all the nuclear weapons uh, uh, in the peninsula. But uh, only the Korea and the US uh, held two premises. And then, but unfortunately in 1993, North Korea withdrew from the uh, non proliferation nuclear um, proliferation treaty, the uh, so-called NPT, and then it has been, uh, the country has been developing its nuclear programs since then with a uh, slick round of nuclear tests. So that's a very basic uh, history of the nuclear weapon situation in the Korean Peninsula. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, now, uh, I just want to remind um, all of our participants, you're free to chat in questions to me or to everybody, and I'll pick those up, curate them, and ask the panelists. Uh, let me just pick up now on uh, something that Mark said, a very, um, very clear and very strong statement about the importance of um, Korea and the Northeast Asian region in terms of driving the global economy. Um, and, and so if I can pick up on that for just a moment, last week's Economist magazine looked into their crystal ball and they tried to help us understand what is coming in the future on a post pandemic global economy. Uh, the three things to, to summarize, they said the global economy will be more globalized, less digitized and less equal. So I'd like to ask, maybe starting with Mark, since it's the Korea Economic Institute, to look into your own crystal balls and, and tell us a little bit about any kinds of um, changes or things we might expect to see either in the, the um, Asia Pacific region and its economy, the US-Korea economic relationship, all looking at a kind of post pandemic economy. Any thoughts on that, Mark? Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, there's several. Uh, let me do two lines of thought quickly. One is that the economy is going to change. Um, the Chatham House in London, Robin Niblett, their director there, made a very interesting statement that the world's going to change from a just-in-time economy to a just-in-case economy. So I think post-pandemic, countries are going to be concerned that they have reliable supply chains. They can get supplies that they think they need for their own safety and security, store, uh, either produced domestically or, or warehoused at some expense. And so trade may change its patterns to make sure that uh, countries feel safer in the event that supply lines are, are disrupted. So what does that amount to? Um, it'll be very interesting to see how that, how that works out, what governments do with, with the need to have just-in-case processing and manufacturing. Um, the other issue is there's a blurring now between economics and security. It's kind of new for us. Usually in the American government, you had political officers, you had economic officers, and they had different work completely. The political people worked on security, which meant hardware, military alliances, uh, missiles, and the economy, economic folks worked on making sure there's free and fair competition in the world. But now you've got a big country, China, and others that are less reliably wedded to the rules of the road, the WTO, traditional means of conducting commercial enterprise. So what happens if those lines blur? If we're getting into economics that looks like it touches on national security, at what point do governments intervene? I'm taking the, thinking of the Huawei case in this example. So a big Chinese company produces a lot of 5G equipment. US government is very uneasy about having Huawei equipment in global networks. So if we're gonna push back against that, 
is that commercial competition where we're trying to advantage US companies or is it national security? And if Huawei's national security, but what about other things? Flat, flat displays, artificial intelligence, machine learning. How many of those are economic competition and how many of those are national security? That's gonna be a big issue to deal with. Thanks a lot for that, Mark. Uh, HK, um, could I ask you to come in on that one? Kind of views looking ahead on the economy post pandemic. Hmm. I think this is the hardball question that I should look at. <laughs> 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 so I will, I will let her uh, okay. first answer the question and, uh, and then um, I, will, I will add in that. No problem. Angela, the hardball comes to you. I don't know. I think that's the second time that's happened tonight. <laughs> it's a crystal ball. <laughs> question, but, you know, just, well, just broadly changes that you might see in the economy. I do. I do have an answer to crystal ball questions. And my answer to crystal ball questions is if, if I knew exactly what was going to be in that crystal ball, I'd be in Las Vegas right now, or maybe Macau, because I might as well take advantage of that ability. Um, but I do think that Mark is right. Uh, the economy is going to change. How we deal with other countries is going to change. How countries deal themselves is going to change. Um, and I think that I know that uh, we've all, we as the U.S. government have already started thinking about that. We're already looking at um, what are the patterns going forward. And uh, one of the very first ones uh, does deal with supply chains. Um, we want to be able to make sure that we have the ability to have the products that are necessary when we want them and when we need them. And what is the best way to do that? And we fall back to a certain extent on dealing with countries that play by the same set of rules that we do, whether they're the WTO rules, um, whether the, the rules of uh, rule of law, democracy, open, transparent, all of those buzzwords, which actually have meaning. And, and the meaning means that I can count on you. Uh, and, and Mark also uh, said, you know, what are, what are allies? Well, we can count on you. And, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So you'll see the you know, United States government working closely with Korea, working closely with Japan, working closely with Australia, the UK, um, working closely with, with countries all over the world to figure out what is this new, but countries that we have uh, shared values with as to how can we shape uh, what's going to come uh, post COVID. Um, when, when, when this pandemic started, um, if I put on my old hat, I used to do a lot of consular work and consular work means you tend to deal with crises. And um, I can remember the last week of February, maybe even mid-February, it was when the Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan had the um, COVID cases outbreak. And it was kind of, it started in Wuhan, China, but that the Japan piece, we had more transparency. The, the, the People's Republic of China wasn't sharing exactly what was happening in Wuhan. They weren't sharing the data. The Japanese as a democracy, open, free, they were sharing everything that was happening on the Diamond Princess. And it's kind of when it started to open eyes, what was gonna happen. But my thought was, there's nothing worse than a slow crisis. So a crisis that is an earthquake, it's terrible. People lose their lives, but it's usually an earthquake and it's over. You may have an aftershock or two, but that's it. A hurricane, same thing. It's gonna blow through, but then it's out and you're gonna have clean weather. A pandemic is a slow moving crisis and a slow moving crisis that we don't even know the length of how long it's going to be yet. So our, our I think the US government, um, and all of the individual entities within the US government, whether it's the State Department, whether it's the Korea desk, whether it's the Department of Defense, it's the uh, um, Commerce, whoever it happens to be, the rule right now is, is to be flexible, to, 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 to recognize that we are in a changing state and that state could change every month for the next six months. And the idea of of being flexible and thinking flexibly and figuring out how you can make pieces work together. Um, I think sometimes, maybe I'm biased. Okay, I am biased. Um, that there's a, a, a thought that our, our government as a whole is very structured and very strict and that's not something they do well. I do think over the past six months in a lot of areas, we have shown some flexibility and we will continue to show that flexibility in order to do what we need to do.
So with the economy, I think that's where we're going. No clear answers yet, but as long as we're willing to be flexible and figure out exactly what the next steps need to be based on what's happening in the world this moment, we should be okay. Thanks, Angela. HK, anything to add? If not, we've got plenty more questions, that's for sure. I would just add one thing that the, the, uh, the era will be different uh, after the corona uh, pandemic. Some people say it's BC before corona and then AC after corona. So our government, uh, our country is also preparing the post, so-called post-pandemic era. And then um, there's, a, there's a very interesting forecast by IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund, that they, they forecasted our uh, economic uh, growth rate is among the, the number one uh, uh, among OECD countries. So which means that we are quite well prepared for the post uh, COVID-19 era. And as Angela mentioned, uh, there will be some impact on the supply chain as well. So uh, for so far, our uh, manufacturers has been, um, many of our manufacturers uh, have been stationed in China because of the low uh, labor cost. But with after experiencing this COVID uh, pandemic, we are trying to uh, diversify our supply chains uh, uh, with the help with like-minded countries like the U.S. and uh, and Japan and other countries, so um, we are as a, as a, as a one of uh, middle powers, we are trying to facilitate the cooperation and coordination uh, between you know, among the uh, like-minded countries. So, um, so for example, we have joined the so-called Alliance for Multilateralism, which is an informal network of more than fifty countries that seek to shore up multi -net, multilateral institutions. So um, I, I fully agree with econo economists uh, forecast that it will be more uh, 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 less digitalized, but uh, we will try, we'll be an active player in revitalizing uh, multilateralism. Over. Thank you for that. Um, so, Let's go to another question that I received from uh, one of our participants. What is Korea's position and approach to the climate crisis? So we, we did have a question um, from some of our students asking about climate policy um, from the Republic of Korea and any um, partnership and relationship between Korea and other countries on climate issues. Maybe HK, I could start with you on that one. Uh, sure. Um, so before I answer the question, I, I, I might confess that I'm a political uh, officer, so I have a lot, I don't have a lot of knowledge on the climate uh, issue. But recently, um, our president, President Moon Jae-in, uh, declared a so-called uh, Korean uh, Green New Deal policy, which uh, will uh, innovate our uh, climate change, climate policy. And um, for example, we, at the start of our uh, administration, we have declared uh, to, um, to diversify our energy sources, not only focusing on the nuclear energy, but also other uh, reusable uh, energies, include, including the solar uh, energy. So that could be the part of our uh, climate, broader climate change. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, all I have right now. Okay, um, I don't. Mark, you had a, a few comments this morning on on climate. Um, would you like to come in on that one? Yeah, very briefly. I would just say that South Korea takes climate change very seriously, and they're attacking it seriously. They're engaged in some very innovative and impressive programs. Uh, there's an island called Jeju off the coast. And they're using that as a laboratory to create a carbon neutral environment. So they're gonna reach that quite quickly in Jeju. They're big on solar panels. They're looking at innovative ways to create electricity by uh, the chemical reaction between salt water and fresh water off the coast. They're doing a lot of terrific work and South Korea sees it as being an economic opportunity. They see uh, green technologies as being one of their economic drivers in the, in the future. And they're partnering with the US on a lot of that. Angela, any, any thoughts um, from your side? Um, I think that 
on a broader scale, maybe not just climate change, but environmental cooperation between our two countries, there are a couple of areas that, very specific areas that the US and Korea have worked together on. One of them is air quality and uh, testing uh, the air quality in Seoul, looking at air quality indexes. Um, Seoul's had some issues with this and they've um, worked to improve them. Uh, COVID has done more to improve <laughs> air quality uh, around the world uh, than uh, just about anything else. Um, that is what it is. Uh, and also with uh, marine waste. In other words, um, we work closely with them on cleaning up, cleaning up the oceans. Uh, Korea is uh, of course, uh, a peninsula, but in many ways, the Republic of Korea is actually an island. There's no free movement across North Korea. Um, it's surrounded on three sides by water. Uh, so as Mark mentioned, they are at the, at the, at the, at the, at the lead of the pack and looking at uh, how are we going to deal with rising waters around the world and how do you combat that? And if, if their success um, in other high-tech industries, semiconductors, um, everything, that's, everything that the uh, SK does, Samsung, LG, um, all of those, fo all of those uh, corporations, uh, I think that uh, very soon will be, the world will be purchasing new products from South Korea that fall into what HK mentioned, uh, the new green deal. So I think we have time to squeeze in a couple more questions. Um, I'd like to ask another from one of our participants. Um, and, and maybe I'll start with you, Mark, on this one, because in your um, introductory remarks, you did touch on investment. We spoke a bit about trade uh, and regional economy, um, but uh, this participant asked, please talk about Korean investment in the United States. So maybe you could give us a, a kind of broad overview of where is the Republic of Korea investing in the United States and what does that mean for our economy? Sure, I, I wish I had the numbers right in front of me. I can get them to you later, but, but the Korean investment in the United States is, is huge. It's all over the place and it provides good high paying jobs. So some of the biggest em employers in uh, the South and Georgia and Alabama are Hyundai and Kia. They've invested in uh, the Hankook Tire Company in Kentucky. They've got a very large LG chemical plant in New Orleans, excuse me, in, uh, in Louisiana. They've got big investments. And so they employ lots of Americans. I wish that story was told more. And the president talks about the trade balance a lot. He doesn't talk about the direct investment from Koreans in the United States as much as the US should probably highlight. And I saw the number that the average salary of the Americans who the Korean companies employ in large numbers was high. It was like $98,000 a year. So they're providing lots of good high paying jobs. Thanks, Mark. Angela, how about over to you on this one? Um, Korean investment in the United States. Yeah, I just, I just looked through my papers as well to see if I had the numbers in front of me. And I'm sorry that I also don't, but I can tell you that in the past four years, the the uh, foreign direct investment by Korea in the United States has been the largest it's ever been. Um, the, the Lotte plant in, in um, Lake Charles, Louisiana uh, is a $10 billion investment. Um, and it is in a place where our unemployment rate is quite high. Um, so there's a company that is uh, over the next seven to 10 years, we'll have a total of $10 billion invested in an economically depressed area of the United States. It will hire people um, to work in their, in their chemical plants. Um, the uh, Samsung has got uh, a state-of-the-art facility in Austin, Texas. Right. Um, there is, uh, I think Mark mentioned the, the automobile industry is mostly in the Southern states in the United States. There's a corridor in Georgia where there's a Kia and Hyundai and they employ the whole surrounding region. Um, the uh, job numbers are significant and uh, it's, uh, it's a win uh, for both countries. And I think it's um, something, again, a little bit hard to predict with COVID, but I don't see, I don't see the investment stopping in the United States. I think it's gonna keep coming. Um, they want to invest in places where they're secure supply chains and we're one of them. Uh, so 
if Montana's got something to offer, it's time to start talking to the Koreans. <laughs> well, there's plenty to offer here in Montana. I know. And we're already speaking with the Koreans, of course. HK, over to you on that one. Any um, additional thoughts on Korean investment in the U.S.? Uh, sure. I want to share one anecdote. So as I uh, said uh, in my opening remarks, uh, my wife is now in Alabama and I had to drive her um, to help her settling in. So from Washington, D.C. to Alabama, we drove about like 10 to 12 hours. Uh, but on the way to Alabama, I was passing through Georgia uh, and I saw a huge uh, car factory and there was a Kia sign on it. And I was I got really curious as a, as a Korean diplomat intuitively. <laughs> um, I got curious, oh, what, is, what is the factory with Kia Petra? And I found out that that's a factory that was established a couple of years ago and then the, the two ambassadors, uh, the U.S. ambassador uh, to Korea, Harry Harris, and the formal uh, Korean ambassador to the U.S., Ambassador Cho, uh, visited together the, the car factory that I saw uh, in Georgia. And then the, the economic, they were uh, praising the economic uh, effect that the factories have been um, creating in the region. And... I saw an article that the Alabama, the state Alabama and Georgia is getting a, a lot of economic benefit from all the Korean companies uh, 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 that are located there. So I, I think it's a good anecdote to capture the, the Korea's investment in, in, in the country. Thanks for that. Um, now we do have time uh, for one more question and um, I would like to, I would like to ask this. I'm, I'm, you know, I was always taught that the question must end with a question mark as an interrogative. I'm, I'm struggling a bit to make this a question. So maybe I'll just leave this as, you know, share your views on the following. But we, we talked about the economy, about security arrangements, the region and so on. Uh, we didn't talk so much about our, our cultural relationship uh, between the U.S. and Korea, which is very important. Now, I'm going to pick up um, on K-pop. Um, but it doesn't have to just be there. But um, uh, I'm and, and um, for those of you who don't know, it's a it's a Korean export of of pop music that's not only popular in the United States but all around the world. Um, so what's interesting to me is not simply that it's popular or that it's from Korea. Actually, K-pop has a it, it's quite unique in that it, it's a blend of you know music, dance, and fashion. It's not simply you know a, a provision of pop music, and that even within the music uh, itself, it's an interesting kind of amalgamation of hip hop and uh, of jazz, in fact, of pop music. And so it's this extraordinary bringing together, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a music, if you will, or a, uh, something at a crossroads, uh, which, which, you know, is, if I'm not stretching the analogy too far, you know, where Korea often finds itself as well, uh, geographically, and in terms of the other issues we, we, we spoke about. So, you know, I just, I, I find it quite extraordinary to be uh, any, I, I've recently returned from, from Myanmar where I spent five and a half years and traveled through the Asian region extensively. And everywhere you go, um, you, you hear K-pop. Um, it, it's incredibly popular. So could I just ask, just for your thoughts and, and opinions, you can pick up on K-pop or any other kind of cultural um, uh, relationships um, that Korea has with the United States and the rest of the world. Angela, I, I know you had a lot to say about K-pop uh, earlier today, so maybe I'll go to you first. Well, I don't know about a lot about K-pop, but I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to hone in on what the teenagers might know about. Um, so uh, I, I did talk a little bit about BTS, which right now is the most uh, successful Korean pop uh, band, and uh, you may have seen them on Saturday Night Live last fall uh, before Saturday Night Live took a hi hiatus. Um, they're doing very well, and if you um, are like me and you don't always fast forward through commercials on TV. They're the ones that are singing both in the Samsung and the Hyundai ads right now. Um, their first uh, song in English, uh, fully in English, uh, called Dynamite. So take a listen uh, to that if you have a chance. Um, it's fascinating also, um, and uh, HK alluded to this, he talked about uh, the BTS army. That's the fans. That's what they call themselves, the fans of BTS. Uh, 
and call themselves the, the BTS Army, and they often they've they're likened to uh, Beatlemania uh, at the, at this point in their fervent uh, following. Um, but Beatlemania on on social media, uh, which of course is a is a new thing, and they have a lot of power. Uh, it's really interesting uh, to watch what they do. Uh, about a to to bring it back a little bit more to, to foreign policy, and and I will do a little bit more culture in a minute, but. Week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago, the uh, the Chinese um, foreign ministry uh, was critical uh, about some comments made by BTS by this K-pop group. Um, and BTS was, you know, they did exactly what what I'm sure their agent told them to do. Which uh, be quiet, just keep singing. Don't uh, engage with the Chinese foreign ministry. Uh, you got a lot of fans in China. Be careful. Um, but the BTS Army, which doesn't have an agent, flooded uh, the social media waves um, and said, this is ridiculous. How could they possibly be picking on BTS? And so they have a lot of power. It's kind of interesting to watch. Um, but what I, uh, what I, uh, I, I like Korean baseball. Um, and I think that that's a, uh, maybe some of you, if you were missing baseball, um, got to see them uh, on ESPN because before Major League Baseball picked up again its season this year, the Korean uh, baseball organization, KBO, was able to uh, start its games up a little bit earlier. Um, they're still showing them on ESPN. You have to – they're at odd hours. You know, right now it's uh, 20 of 11 in the morning in, in Korea. So, you know, you've got all sorts of weird, weird hours to watch these baseball games, but I think that's a lot of fun. But what I do, what I do think is that it, it um, some of these cultural aspects bring us together. Uh, we share baseball. We share this fusion type of music, uh, where there are elements of rock and hip hop and, and jazz that are uh, taken in a different way and turned in a different way uh, by the by the Korean uh, bands. There's um, uh, I obviously with with Parasite winning the Academy Award this year for Best Picture, there is a renewed interest or a new interest in in Korean filmmaking. And because everybody was trapped in their houses for a long time, uh, I, Netflix is, is is showing a lot of Korean dramas and uh, other Korean movies that that might be interesting. Um, but to, to switch it the other way, uh, we actually have in uh, the Republic of Korea, this is pre-COVID, I don't have the new numbers post-COVID, but if you're taking about, you know, December last year, January last year, about 200,000 Americans either live and work in Korea. Um, so they're, they're there as well. There's an exchange that goes on in both directions, positive for both countries. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop there. HK is yeah. uh, is is most definitely the youngest one on here, and he's he, he knows more about the K-pop than any of us uh, combined. So I I, I I need to be quiet now. <laughs> Over to you, HK. I was actually gonna say I'm a bit uh, older old, old to talk about the K-pop, but relatively I'm the youngest. So um, uh, I mean, along with BTS, there are so many other uh, Korean uh, girl groups or boy bands that are playing. Uh, in, in the U.S. Actually, uh, today, uh, at today's Jimmy Kimmel uh, show, there will be a Korean girl group uh, participating in the events. Uh, the girl group name is called Blackpink, and that's it's, it's a very famous girl group, um, along with BTS in Korea. And not only the K-pop, but also the K-food is a, a very uh, uh, another uh, area of the culture uh, that is spreading within the, within the U.S. So every every city has a, has their local magazine inside the U.S. and and I, and I bought the uh, there's a magazine called Washingtonian in in the Washington D.C. and every year um, the first issue of that magazine uh, selects hundred restaurants around uh, the area to visit and the number one place was actually the Korean restaurant. It's called Anju. Uh, it's inside the DC, downtown DC. Anju uh, is Korean, which means uh, finger foods uh, for drinks. So uh, I was really proud to see that uh, the Korean restaurant got selected as a number one restaurant to visit uh, in, in DC. So Angela, if you haven't uh, had a chance to visit, it's reopened. <laughs> so we might get a chance to 
uh, visit yet. And also, as Angela said, uh, the U.S. ambassador to Korea, Harry Hess, he's 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 running uh, his Twitter account really uh, with, with the full of uh, K K cultures. So uh, so for example, he goes to like, a Korean barbershop and gets his beard um, done, and he makes um, Korean dishes. So there's all sorts of uh, video clips, nice, uh, really uh, good video clips for to introduce uh, Korean cultures to, to the US public. So you, you should definitely check out uh, Harry Harry's um, Twitter account. Thanks a lot for that, HK. Um, so we're now coming to the um, end of our show here. I, what I'd like to do is go back to our panelists, uh, Mark, Angela, then HK, for a final 30 seconds, if there's anything, uh, last word or anything you may have missed. Mark, over to you. I think you're on mute, Mark. I just wanted to shut me up. Okay. <laughs> I'm I want to go back to a conversation you had earlier in the day with the students, because you talked about uh, feeling between Koreans and Americans. I want to touch on that briefly. I don't know if it's politically correct to say that some cultures just click better than others, but Americans and Koreans tend to communicate easily. There's something about the two cultures that just work together really well. I, I can't put my finger on what it is. Well, I'll give you an anecdote that kind of shows that. Uh, I was working at Seoul at the embassy. I had some business to do with the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs across the street. So I walked over to see my Korean colleague there and walked in with my, with my papers and started by saying, well, how are you doing? And he said, I'm exhausted. He said, I just had a delegation here from a large Asian country for several days. We've been negotiating with them. I'm just tired. He said, it's so nice to have a phone. You come over so I can just be myself. We can put our feet up and just talk. So I, I took this as a great compliment that uh, this is kind of how Koreans and Americans get along. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful country for us to work with. Great. Thank you very much. Angela, last words to you. Well, uh, I, I know that, uh, that travel is difficult at these times, uh, but I'll play a little bit of travel agent. And I would uh, recommend that if you have a chance, uh, go to Korea. Um, it's a fascinating country. The people are wonderful. They are welcoming. Um, unlike many people that have uh, spent a lot of time, in, uh, unlike many of my colleagues who have spent a lot of time learning Korean, I did not have the advantage of learning Korean. So my Korean is very limited. I can say, please, thank you. And may I please have a beer. Uh, but, uh, that's, uh, but if you go to Korea and you uh, look confused, undoubtedly somebody's going to help you and they are most likely going to speak to you in English and if they aren't they're going to find a younger person who then will speak to you in English and will help you out it's a it's the food is fantastic the baseball is great the travel times are quick they got trains that go from city to city so there you go I'm going to play travel agent uh and uh I think every diplomat does um everybody learns when you travel and I think at whatever age, uh, no matter how young and no matter how old, if you have an opportunity to travel, you should do so. Korea is a great place to go. And I'll Thanks. end there. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. HK, over to you. Yeah, actually, I remember that I visited Montana, the Glacier National Park. Uh, it was almost uh, more than 20 years ago, but I really enjoyed all the lakes and the trees, <laughs> the state. And I would really love to visit uh, Montana if there's a, a, any chance. And again, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to first uh, talk with uh, you, uh, you guys about the, the Korea-US relationship. I'm, I'm so honored to uh, speak with you guys. Thank you. Well, let me say thanks to the three panelists, Mark, Angela, and HK. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your views, your perspectives on U.S.-Korean relations in the 21st century, uh, K-pop, um, baseball, you name it, we covered it here tonight. So we really appreciate you coming on. And of course, special thanks to the Korea Economic Institute and the World Affairs Councils of America for their support in bringing you this episode of Connect Montana. Let me close by reminding our participants that next week, we've got another extraordinary series. With the U.S. domestic elections coming up, we're going to have a series looking at international elections, 
we've invited experts from the United Nations, from the International Foundation of Electoral Systems and the Carter Center to talk to us about how elections happen outside of America and what we might learn from that. That's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. Check out your email, check our website, check our social media for more information. Once again, thank you to our guests and thank you to our participants for a wonderful evening. Be well and goodbye.